I think everything's working here. Glad to have everybody on board today. Um, today's insights uh, from the light um, are very interesting. Uh, quite often the light um, uh, wants to share some things that are uh, kind of a strong cup of tea. And I've learned this um, in my 30 years of working with uh, the light that, that I talk about. I've learned that uh, it's not all Pollyanna sometimes and it's not all rainbows sometimes. Um, light can be a very serious uh, thing to deal with. And so uh, that's what the light wants to talk about today is, is light energy and sometimes the trouble with light. So, um, so the idea is here that um, we live in the time of light. The, um, from the creation of the universe, the universe was not created with light. Uh, it, light came afterwards. And a lot of people don't understand that. We, we come from something actually before light even. And um, so, you know, one of the metaphors might be, say, in our, in our culture, say in the Christian, uh, that uh, God, um, God spoke and then there was light. And that, 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 what that really is a metaphor for, first there was the, the first vibration and then light came after that. So um, the, uh, the idea is that there was, a, a, uh, there was probably no light at all in the beginning of the Big Bang that people hear about. There's no evidence of that. Um, and the uh, age of stars is where we start getting into starlight, is the age that we're a part of in, in this particular uh, universe. And uh, so imagine what, what light is all about in its, in its highest sense. Um, and um, it, is, it is energy, and the predominant particle in the entire universe is photons. It's called the cosmic background radiation. And for every photon, uh, for every particle, every atom on every planet and every star and every piece of this entire universe, for every particle that exists, there are two billion photons. So <laughs> the predominant uh, energy in this universe is uh, photon light. The interesting thing is that the cosmic background radiation, which is the, the largest um, physical source, there's dark energy, but that's, that's different than what we're talking about now. The, uh, the, the wavelength of the cosmic background radiation is infrared light, which turns out to be uh, very healing and aspects of phototherapy and things like that. Very interesting how kind of that all worked out. But the idea here about light is is that um, that's why we can't, we, we, as great as our sciences are, we will never see all the way back to the Big Bang because we, we then go to a period where there was no light, no, no um, uh, reflections as we know it. It was, um, it was a soup, so to speak. And uh, so so it might, you might liken it to a dark room to us. We wouldn't be able to see anything, nothing at all. Um, and uh, so the, in, the interesting thing about light is that, that, that I've been taught, and that is that light adds definition to things. Say you're in a dark room, and you can stumble around and bump yourself, and you can hear noises, and you're not quite sure what's in that totally dark room. There's no definition. You turn on a light, and suddenly everything becomes clear. You know where, where things are. That guy over here, this guy over there, that's over here. Oh, I don't want to step on this uh, bed of nails that happens to be right over here that I didn't know about. It adds uh, definition, and in that definition, uh, adds a polarity to the universe, which is quite normal. But the interesting thing about this is that when light, and this is why sometimes there can be trouble with light, especially for light workers and saints, and we're going to talk a little bit about this and other aspects of light. The, the thing about light bringers um, and light workers on planet Earth, um, if you'll kind of notice that the great ones in history have all been killed, you know, sacrificed, uh, nailed to a cross, uh, shot, Martin Luther King, you know, all, think of all the, the light bringers that have been killed bringing light, a little bit of light. In my own experience, in bringing uh, light inventions in, um, uh, in the early days when this was also very new, I was challenged quite a bit by uh, people that just thought it was Star trek -y and didn't want to even believe in it because it was Star Trek. I'm just trying to bring a little light into the world, and um, people were getting all upset. But uh, the thing about light is that, and, and this is where it, it can be a little troublesome and delicate to work with, and that is light is non-biased energy. If you shine it on a field, the 
flowers will grow as well as the weeds. Um, and so uh, with our with our work with light, we have to be a little careful with it sometimes. And some of you light workers may know that light can blow up in your face sometimes with the best intentions. Um, and the idea is that with the light workers and, and the, the people who brought in light and, and, and our great martyrs and saints, um, is that when you're with someone who is this light, they what is what's the first thing that light does? It creates shadows. It shows you where the, all the shadows are. And the same thing about someone like Martin Luther King coming into society. His light showed where all the shadows of, of racism was clearly like never before. That's why a lot of people hated him, and that's why he was killed, because of his light. And that he was, everybody's shadows became obvious at that point, causing great change and shift. But he gave his life um, to be his light. And the same thing with the saints and uh, martyrs throughout our history. Just think about it. In our own lives, uh, I've known many a light worker who uh, has been challenged, attacked, um, and things like that over the years uh, because they were light. I remember um, back um, after my near-death experience when I first started talking about it, uh, I was invited by the library system of North Carolina to give a talk on metaphysics. I know, like I was an expert or something. I wasn't, but I, I said I'd give it a shot. And uh, so it turned out to be the first lecture of that type ever given in the system. And there was, uh, it made the newspapers. I mean, uh, lots of people showed up, but also there were people outside with placards, and there was a woman on a horse dressed like a witch, and saying it was all pagan and all that. I was going, <laughs> it was just too much, but the library held in and let me do the talk. Um, so uh, many of you uh, may have experienced this kind of thing and, and, and wondered why. Uh, it's because of the nature of light and the nature of light revealing. Now, what's interesting is, is, is this is quite often like the truth. So you have to be careful with the truth and you have to be careful with light. Um, you know, some people say that um, they tell the truth all the time, but how often have you heard people like that just hurting people's feelings? I just say what I want to say. I just tell the truth, and it's their truth. It may not be a correct truth, and it may not be a kind truth in an appropriate moment. So the truth can dissect people, and the truth can set people free. It's very touchy stuff. It's uh, and quite often for novices in light work. It's like children playing with fire, and uh, um, and there's all types of, of this uh, type of light here. Now it's very important to learn that um, with your light, don't be superior with it. It, it. it can feed back on you in a way that's very interesting. Uh, it, uh, your light will also show your own shadows if you're a light worker, and I think many of you may know what I'm talking about. The more you work with the light, the more your own stuff becomes quite clear, and in a way you can then self-process. But um, the light, like the truth, uh, is something that um, uh, needs to be handled very gently and kindly and appropriately on, on any given situation. Before my near-death experience, I was, I was guess, I, I guess I was what you call a bubble popper. Um, and I, I used to be one. I used to be a bubble popper. People would, I could pop bubbles. I was uh, always a very curious uh, guy about everything and I could pick people's things apart. And I didn't realize until um, after my near-death experience that that was not fun or appropriate in many cases to do that. So um, uh, that's not kind, and it's especially not kind to pop children's bubbles. These are, these are people that may not be as advanced as you think you are or as spiritual as you think you are. And there's no point in trying to pop these kind of bubbles. It's like, um, it's like trying to ch tell a child there's no Santa Claus. Why? I mean, what's the point of that? Um, uh, maybe when they grow up, maybe when they find it out on their own, that is an appropriate time. But in the uh, in the early years of our light development, in the early years of our spiritual path, we're very much like children on a path, and almost any shiny thing will attract our attention. And this is why um, it's very it's very you have to be very careful with this. And gurus and teachers of the highest order are very careful with this. And even though you may think you're a grown up, they you know you may be presenting yourself as a child, and they will treat you in that way, in a different way than someone who's really ready for the deeper knowledge. Very important to understand. Um, you know, an example is uh, you've got you know 
people trying to tell children there's no Santa Claus or Easter money. Um, these are things that come along. Um, you'll find this out on your own at some point. Um, same thing about um, uh, a lot of religious stuff is the same way. It's a lot of Santa Claus stuff, but it's, it's uh, you know, I'm not out and, and it's not kind to go pick on people for these sort of things. Um, I remember when I was a child, um, my, uh, my, I had already figured out that my father was Santa Claus, but I didn't tell anybody. And one day, uh, while driving downtown during Christmas, I was in the back seat with my brother, or my mother and father in the front seat, and my brother whispers to me, I think Daddy's Santa Claus. And I, I said, shh, be quiet, we, you know, or we won't get any presents. So, <laughs> so these things are, you know, the, 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 the truth comes out in, in its own natural order, um, especially on these things that are not of monumental importance. Um, like uh, like trying to prove to someone there's no God or anything. It's just um, it's like you know popping bubbles with people. There are um, when you're working with light, it's very important to learn to adjust your light body to any given situation because too much light can be overwhelming and actually destroy things. And uh, then again, not the right light in the given moment, the right wavelengths and frequencies uh, can. Uh, make others uh, fearful or, or even make them weak in some points. Uh, too much of anything can make can cause a weakness in, in some areas. I've learned this over the years. Um, in the early years of working uh, with light and uh, we had our, our, our healing uh, facility, we would bring people in and in those days I would say I dragged people in kicking and screaming and we were, we were going to heal you today. And I learned, I learned a lot of lessons in those years about uh, when people are ready, um, what they're ready for and things like that. So light is uh, it has a double edge to it, and it can cause trouble as uh, quite often as much as um, as heal. It's it's just one of those facts of the universe is totally non-biased in, in that aspect. And so, uh, and uh, there is a dark side to light, and that dark side of light is that it does cause it does expose shadows and create shadows along the way, and uh, that can be very tricky to navigate. Very, very tricky to navigate. The interesting thing about that, I'm going to move on now, the interesting thing about light is that you have a light, you are a light in your core essence, and it is the most powerful light you will ever own or ever possess. Um, this core essence light is who you really are, and um, depending on our situations, uh, being raised uh, poor and abused or, or being raised with a fantastic dream family uh, tends to shape the kind of light you're able to generate. And that is your absolute core light. Now that light can be added to, the frequencies can change, but there's a core light that actually is very much like your own personality. And uh, because this is your essence, and in unguarded moments and in moments um, we, can, uh, we can see other sides of our light that we didn't even know were there like uh, anger sometimes and things like that. And so it's very important to understand that you are the light you've been looking for. And what we need to do is work with that light primarily uh, and build that light because we're all building here. This is a process. And so um, the um, I call it working with your own light and building your own core light, I call power back to the people. Because for, uh, for since almost day one, we've been thinking shamans had it, and we had to go to shamans for it, or holy places, or the church had it, um, or it was in the Bible, or it was on some far mountain somewhere that we had to go to. All these quests, these uh, heroic quests of the past that are, you know, novels and legends have been uh, written about, um, most of which has been quite unnecessary, actually. We're all born from the source, and this power in your core essence um, is a great power, but you need to exercise it and work with it. Um, and so, um, what, what's what most what, what the, the path has been so far is we try to get um, masters to give us light and even special powers, uh, gods, uh, statues, uh, holy places. We're always asking for uh, this power from some other source. And when you receive, if you acquire light this way, it will surely fade in a while. Have, have any of you noticed that? You know, you can you can be with a very powerful person and be all you know jazzed up and enlightened, and then suddenly it did uh, uh, 
few days later or a while later it fades. Um, I worked with a um, woman once, years and years ago, an American woman, who um, was just one of the most phenomenal um, light workers I'd ever met. And uh, I, um, I was asked to and invited to spend some time with her in a small circle of people uh, at her home. And, and that was two weeks of the craziest time of my life. All these white workers in the same uh, house together uh, with a real master in the house. Uh, this woman was ph phenomenally fantastic. I mean, you could, she could put a voice in your head saying, uh, go up to a certain closet, bring me my shoes. Because I just saw the most incredible things during those two weeks. But I also felt like I was in a snake pit because her light could show all the shadows, and she had shadows too, but she was phenomenal with this work. And uh, I remember at one point thinking, oh, I've seen such bull crap here that my bull crap doesn't even measure up to this stuff. My, 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 bull, my bull crap is just <laughs> diminished being, being around these incredibly powerful people and seeing how people are, they were, the people were staying out of control right and left around this woman's energy. And, um, and it was fascinating to watch, and it went on day and night. And I remember um, after the two weeks, um, uh, I was getting I was getting ready to leave, and she called me to her room, and I sat in her, her room with her privately. And I was uh, a bit depressed, and looking at uh, all, all that I'd witnessed that week was some of the wildest stuff I'd ever seen in spirituality in my life. And, uh, and I would say that most people failed the test those two weeks, and it was some pretty, pretty important people there. But uh, so I, I had felt like I'd been in a snake pit for a couple of weeks, and um, so I was like, you know, just stuck boiling inside me. And so um, I sat down beside her, and she just took one look at me, and she said, "Drop the bucket in the well and bring it up." And I knew what she meant. I, I, I felt like I dropped, I dropped the bucket deep into the well of my being, and I. I tell you, I got a bucket of some really negative, you know, stuff from the experiences that I had, and all that had, all that was in there. And I brought it up. And the minute I, I felt it coming to my throat chakra, she touched me on my third eye, and everything just kind of melted. And I found that I, after that experience, I had, I could not have, a, I couldn't have a negative thought for a couple of years afterwards. And I would try sometimes. It was the most phenomenal thing I'd ever experienced. But I had to go through a real test to get there. And I was really ready to um, see my own stuff and release it. So uh, it was a very, very powerful experience working with this light worker. Um, um, I, I, not, none of us that were at that, um, at that uh, house for those two weeks have ever gotten together again after that also. <laughs> not that I would even care to. But uh, it's incredible what some light workers can do at the right moment with the right amount of energy. And I have always really appreciated um, that experience with her at the very end. It, it really was uh, quite appropriate and timely for me, and, and I appreciate it for, for years afterwards. Um, now, um, if you're always feeding from someone else's light, you cannot grow your own light as well as you could. Your light will always be weaker from need. Very important to understand. Uh, it's good to be around uh, light workers, and, and, and if you're a light worker, uh, you kind of know what I'm talking about. But if, if people are always feeding on the light worker, that's that's a whole different vibration than your core energy. And it can feel good. If, I, I've, I've had blissful moments. I've had Shakti Pog in my life and things like that. But um, in this in this period uh, of your growth of your own light. Um, and I know a lot of people are kind of addicted to other people's light, uh, teachers, spiritual masters, all that sort of thing. But um, a, a master is, uh, what happens is that these masters are really uh, not the end of the path. Uh, a, a truly good master is only a light post on the path of life. But what happens and why cults are formed and why uh, uh, devotees uh, glom onto this is very much like moths glomming onto a light, you know, light pole. Um, and what happens is you, you become blinded by the light and you, you just stick to that light. And you really don't move on for quite a while after that. I've known a good number of gurus and teachers in my life that have uh, expressed in their own words a very similar 
similar thought. Uh, I remember uh, one very famous uh, guru that I, I knew very well until he died uh, would come out to give um, um, uh, the darshan. And uh, he told me one day, he said, when I come out, what I'm seeing is a bunch of drunkards on the bottle. That's how he felt. And I, I've seen this from other light workers. And, you know, and these are people that put up with more than I could and probably more than most of us could in trying to bring the light to the world. But there is a, there is a heavy burden on them. And in the end, you need to be building your core light, the core light of your being. And um, uh, so if you feed your own core essence, it's very, very important. And I think what, what we're having to grow up now, we're having to mature as a species on planet Earth, we're having to mature as uh, spiritual beings. And um, most of you at my age, in the baby boomer set, say, you know, 55, 65 and, and up, um, we are now becoming the elders. And um, this is a very important thing to realize now. We're not children anymore. We are becoming the elders, and our elders for, uh, for the last couple of generations have been kind of few and far in between in our modern culture, especially in the West. We've kind of lost the connection with our elders. And um, so, so, we, so we've almost skipped a couple of generations of this very valuable experience um, of honoring and valuing the elders. And now, by, uh, by attrition and aging, we are now becoming the elders, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. We are becoming the elders in our, in our, in our lives, in our families, in our uh, circles. And so uh, it's very, very important to uh, understand that at this time in history, the most important light you can generate is your core essence light. And that core essence really determines what your circle is about. That core essence light really determines the kind of energy you attract to you, um, and I'm talking just spiritual energy now. I'm not talking, um, you know, the secret where you can get millions of dollars and stuff. That's that's different. But your core essence is the type of energy that is exuded from you. It's it's it's, it's it permeates every bit of your your aura. And um, the what people don't understand is is that your aura is a part of your immune system. The arc light that comes out of your body is part of your immune system protecting you from uh, all sorts of subtle energies, uh, light and dark and all of that. And that, uh, that aura is tuned to whatever your core energy is. And your core energy is something that you, uh, you evolve with over time and you evolve with through whatever families you're with. And some of that can be messed up sometimes. Your, 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 your core vibration might be one of need. Your core vibration might be one of uh, issues of abandonment uh, and all of that thing. And I, I think I started out that way. In fact, I know I did. That was my core essence. And so it's almost like having a sign on you. Uh, everybody that's into this, come here. And that's what you get. And uh, I've worked with uh, many people in, in my life since near-death experience. I've, and I've known many, many counselors. And uh, it tend to, whatever you're going through is what you tend to attract into your uh, consulting or into your uh, life, even as friends. And so we really have to examine our core light and resolve those issues. Those issues are not helping you. They're not growing you, and in fact, they may be attracting all the wrong things to you. And um, that core light, the, the essence, can be upgraded, it can be retuned, um, but it is a natural essence that exudes from you, just like your aura does. Everything about you creates your aura. And, um, and so, if your aura is weak, or if your aura is full of holes, or if your aura is tuned to let all, all sorts of indiscriminate energies into your life and into your, into your uh, arc circle, well then you, you pay the price for that. And so it's very important to understand that light itself is not a magic wand. And because it's time for us to mature, there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there that, um, that think that um, uh, they, the ma they, they can find a magic wand or a technique or a secret somewhere that will change uh, will change their life without them having to do much about it or anything. This is, this is what I see all the time out there. Um, um, and so uh, uh, to change these things takes some effort. It takes some exercise. It takes some practice. And, uh, uh, and this is the kind of thing that will come naturally from you at the right time. So there's no guilt trips here. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not ready to exercise, 
recognize your chakras, you're not ready to exercise your light, if you're not ready to practice with it, fine. But, but uh, don't expect these magic wands to come along. Uh, I haven't seen one yet you know, that, that could be transferred to you permanently or have a permanent change on you in, in one way or another. Now, people may split hairs on that, but um, uh, there's something to understand about this magic wand um, mentality we have in the West quite often, and I've seen quite a bit of it in the East that someone's just going to come and touch us on our third eye or give us a blessing, sprinkle some holy water on us, and then I don't have to do anything else. It's all going to change for me. Well, um, as we mature as beings on this planet and as a species on this planet, it's, uh, we're cutting into a time of which the, the mass population of the planet is maturing very rapidly now, and this will benefit us in our next incarnations, of course, but we're right in the thick of it right now. So one way to feed your core essence light, because you have to feed it, it's, you know, this, is, uh, this is all, again, not magic, it's nature, and to feed your core essence light, Deep breathing is an incredible technique. And you've got to exercise your body and exercise your chakras because this builds up light, loosens electrons. I call it shake up your chakras. And uh, it's very easy to do, just, uh, but, but we're not, uh, none of us really do it enough. And that is um, the exercise of your body and the exercise of your chakras is more like dancing, singing, and drumming, and movement. Um, you just can't sit still and acquire a tremendous amount of energy. Um, there, there may be some gurus that can exhibit that, and, and I've tested many people with curling devices and others. But generally speaking, um, you need to get your chakras in motion. You need to shake your chakras up and uh, dust them off occasionally. I mean, how, how many of you ever exercise your chakras? They're just laying around, right, doing their own thing. You don't have to do anything with them. Uh, so maybe go to a healer and say, fix my chakra. Well, um, it's, it's very important to uh, shake your chakras. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be wild, you know, um, crazy dancing or anything. It can be very smooth. It could be like uh, Tai Chi. But it's an important part of working with light that I think spiritual people need to understand is to take care of your body and your chakra system. Um, this changes your aura. Uh, this changes what you attract to yourself. And this also gives you reserves of energy to not only heal yourself and, and maybe heal people you, know, you're, you may be working with, but it's very, very important for the evolution of your being. Because if, uh, if your chakras are not, are not very active and dusty and you haven't really used them, you're kind of just waiting for the universe to throw stuff at them, uh, you can, you're probably going to get weaker and weaker. And so uh, it's good to have these uh, chakra massages. It's good to have the chakra crystal treatments and all that. But again, you're asking someone to do it to you with, while you're just laying there on the table. All that, you know, all that all that's good. Um, I like that stuff too. But you've really got to get up and rock those chakras and uh, jiggle them up. And, and you'll find it's, they'll light up a lot lighter, a lot more light in them. You, you'll test differently when you do tests after this. Uh, it's very, very uh, important. The, um, um, these could be called active ceremonies of acquiring more mana. And mana is the same thing as chi and, and pran and all that. It's, it's your life, uh, it's this life essence that we, we can bring into our bodies and store. So, uh, so I, I call these, um, uh, you know, shaking up your chakras and, and exercising your body and chakra system together, active ceremonies. I mean, it can be a lot of fun. And it could be just dancing to some good music at home. Very important to understand this. It's not going to happen just all mentally or just by laying on a table and letting someone do it for you. You have to participate in your own evolution more than just mentally or more than just reading a book and, um, or, or taking a seminar occasionally. Um, now, um, is your mana, is your mana or your chi deficient? Have you checked out your mana meter? <laughs> you know, uh, a good way to check out your mana meter is through uh, curling photography or uh, self-muscle testing. And uh, you, you can look that up on the Internet. It's holding a couple of fingers together doing self-muscle testing. 
something in the blood test that your doctor doesn't really explain to you called uh, the redox effect, which is basically the energy in the blood, the, the electron content, basically, the electrical potential. And that is mana. Uh, elect, uh, mana is electrons. And, um, and so, uh, so you even see this uh, in blood tests, um, but it probably has never been explained to you what that really means. But uh, that's one of the things that, that we test for. So um, um, deep breath, and can you breathe deeply for several minutes without passing out? It takes practice um, or getting too dizzy, becoming disoriented. Uh, you need to, uh, to get into this higher consciousness that we're moving into. It also requires higher energy. And uh, this higher energy can uh, directly come in from uh, uh, exercising your chakras, making your chakras active again, and also uh, deep breathing. Very, very healthy, very, very full of uh, mana and uh, prana. Um, so, um, so, there is, so there can be trouble with light. Um, I have known many a light worker where things kind of blew up on them. I've, uh, there, there are uh, there are studies, very good studies that have been done um, about these thought forms and, and uh, this kind of light work that are very interesting. Um, um, just just to point out something, as I said earlier, uh, when the sun shines on a field, when the light shines on a field, everything grows. The weeds, the flowers, everything grows. It's non-biased. Very important to understand when you're working in healing energy. Um, uh, some of you may not be aware of it, but there were some great studies done on uh, there was there were these techniques, and um, you can check me on this. There are these techniques um, when people have cancer, where they where they learn to visualize, they visualize, and they visualize the cancer uh, one way or another, and they you know sometimes they visualize they've got a machine gun shooting it, or other people envision other things. And uh, there have been some very interesting results in that, um, working with light that way, because thoughts are light. I want you to understand that thoughts are light being generated in your, out of your chakra system. And, uh, and the transference of this energy is coming out of your chakra systems and your core essence. These studies were quite interesting, and, and uh, they were done over a long period of time. And they discovered that uh, they could teach the same techniques to a number of cancer patients, and in some of them, the technique would increase the cancer growth dramatically, dramatically, and in others it would work as expected. When they analyzed this, they discovered that the technique they were teaching was to kill the cancer, and um, so they found that uh, the people that, um, that it wasn't working on and their cancers were growing were people that couldn't kill a fly. They couldn't kill anything. So this technique, they were adding in the energy of the light, and the energy of the light's going in, but it's like that field. Everything was growing. It's, uh, so I've often said, and, and some people may disagree with me, but, uh, but you know, I've, uh, I've, had to, I've had to learn everything I know on the streets of, uh, of light. Um, it's, it's very important to understand that um, this idea of, of, of being able to have a little bit of killer in you, a little bit of wanting to stay alive. Um, uh, you can't let everything in the universe get to you. And so, uh, especially when you're applying light to things, you, uh, you've got to do it with the right person at the right time in their lives. Uh, they may be begging for it, but it may not be the right time to use powerful light. Um, so, um, in this respect, as you, as you use light with people, you'll find that um, you really need to talk at a couple of other levels with them. Uh, if they're the kind of person that couldn't harm a blade of grass, mm, you've got to use some other techniques besides powerful light. And also remember, uh, and this is splitting, some people like to split hairs to infinity, but you are trying to get rid of the cancer to eradicate it. Um, and so you've got to use images that the universe will respond to and, and the cancer cells will respond to. Now, you can just throw love and light on it, but, you know, sometimes that works. Quite often it doesn't, honestly. You've got to use other techniques. And uh, uh, so uh, a, wise, a wise healer, a wise light worker uh, probably already knows this and can figure it out. But uh, don't be surprised if sometime if it kind of backfires on you because it was an appropriate um, or, or not the right technique for the right person. Um, also, um, uh, when, when working, when, when light workers are working with um, uh, these kind of really serious diseases, life-threatening diseases, the, the, the first question,
they're not depressed on drugs and they're just finished, they're finished with this incarnation. So all the putzing around, they're usually doing it just for the family, not for themselves. So it's, it's very interesting how, how you, can, you need to work with light in some very subtle areas. Now another thing that, uh, and some of this some of you may not like to hear, but it's pure experience and you can check me out on it. There's an interesting phenomenon happened with the uh, New Age and Light movement uh, almost from the very beginning. And this is something the light warned me about. Um, and that is, imagine this. Um, the New Age became very popular. All these books were being printed and uh, certain publishers were becoming very wealthy on this. I, I've been in many books and I know many authors who've had uh, bestsellers. Um, and I can tell you, I have known authors with bestsellers that couldn't make their house payment because of the publisher. And so here's the interesting metaphor the light was pointing out to me, that all these light workers, and there were great, there's been great ones. We've had some of the greatest light workers ever in our times. Imagine this. They did the work. They did the evolution. They did the work. And then they sold their work to a publisher, and a publisher buys all rights. It's no longer your work or your story anymore. And that could last 17 to 25 years. And so they can do anything they want with your story. And so imagine, and, and I, I hope this doesn't break anybody's heart, but it, it certainly has given me pause to uh, think many times uh, because I've seen what authors have gone through with publishers. And that is that, imagine this, you sell your story to a publisher who doesn't really even believe in what you believe in. You're, you're just another book. You, they think they can make money off of you. And I've, I've dealt with many publishers, and, and many of you may wonder why I haven't put out a book yet. Well, it's, it's all rigmarole like that. I, nowadays, with self-publishing, you become more self-empowered. But still, um, all the great light workers, almost all of them, sold their light. And this is the one thing the uh, light instructed upon me originally was don't sell your light. Don't sell your story to where someone else can own it. And so I've gone round and round with publishers in my, in my time about this very subject. You know, I, I said, you can, you can, okay, you can make money off my story, but you can't own my story. It's my story. You can't technically own it. Well, I haven't found one yet that uh, would, would agree to, uh, to any arrangement that might benefit uh, the author in the end uh, in a very valuable way. So imagine that all these light workers that have done the work, it's made me very, very sad. I wish I were very, very rich. Uh, there are so many light workers I, I would love to take care of, especially now in their old age. And um, publishers have gotten rich, and a publisher, if they don't want you to have a book out, I mean, if they don't give your book enough time to get legs, eh, you lose it all. So anyway, the, the stories about the light are very fascinating, uh, how it can work for you and against you. So um, I think a lot of people can be Pollyanna about, you know, the light's all good. Well, the light is just light. It's like a knife, you know. You can cut yourself with it or you can, uh, you know, cut a piece of cake. You can, you can make something with it. The light's just the light. Um, and it is completely unbiased uh, in that way. And if you use it wrong, it's quite often going to backfire on you like any other energy. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's just a pure energy that we can control in many ways with our minds and our bodies and our chakras. So it's very, very important to understand that. Now, um, 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 the next thing is the, the path and light. And from this point of view where I'm coming from, there are three paths to light and working with light. The first path is called the river, where you just jump in the river and you go down the river. And the river of life has many um, uh, interruptions, side paths, but eventually you will probably get to the ocean. Um, so if, uh, and that's how most people live, actually. They just kind of throw themselves uh, like a leaf on the river and go down the river of life. And um, eventually you, you, you will probably find the ocean. It'll take longer, though, that way. Um, uh, another way is that uh, the light of the masters and gurus can be a very mixed path. Depending on the type of master you choose based on the issues with yourself, the world, and the universe, you take you take these masters based on your own issues. And uh, um, forgive me for saying this, but I've been around a long time now, and um, I've heard enough stories and witnessed enough stuff that I know that uh, very few gurus are perfect. Uh, only blind devotees believe that. They're uh, blind devotees. 
of these, you're taking it from your own issues with yourself, your own issues with the world you live in, and the universe in general, this whole God thing and life after death thing, your issues with this. Um, the sad thing is to see people that have glommed on to uh, techniques and masters that are obviously not giving them desired results. You need to move on. You need to get your desired results that you're looking for and move on. Um, now, the, the third way in this particular conversation is finding and following your core essence and practicing the generation of light for your own core. In other words, you've got to feed your core. You've got to put light in, too. Um, uh, and so all energy needs to be uh, replenished, refreshed. And uh, we're given, uh, in biology, when we're born, um, you come out of your mother's body, and she can only give you what she has to give you. Those are called organ reserves. And so these organ reserves, depending on how much you can challenge your body in your youth with, uh, you know, sugars and alcohols and drugs and all that, but typically speaking, uh, your, your organ reserves will, will probably last you around mid-20s and 30s, and, by, and then you start noticing changes in your body. And certainly by 30 to 40, you're noticing changes. Uh, now you're living on just whatever energy you're picking up along the way. Your mother's energy is usually burned up by that. Uh, that's why uh, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the pancreas and, and these organs that generate your digestive enzymes sort of wear out. And that's why at a certain age, suddenly you notice I can't eat cold pizza in the morning anymore. I, there's certain things I can't eat anymore because it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays in my belly. Um, those are the signs of the changes. Now, you can do something about this. You're not stuck with it. In fact, nowadays, we have so many things we can do that our ancestors had to suffer through endlessly. You can't imagine the suffering of our ancestors. I mean, geez, you know, it's pretty, pretty intense uh, all the way around. So, um, so it's very easy, as I described a little bit earlier, through, uh, through your shaking your chakras, dusting off your chakras, putting light into your body. And, and that can be through breathing. You can breathe light into your body because light is really photons um, and, and technically electrons. But you can breathe it in. You can, uh, I wouldn't stare at the sun or anything. That's not been proven to be very good so far. I've seen the um, uh, eye examinations of people that have done that. But uh, the breathing of the energy, the the proper food is full of energy for you, so as you become a more mature being, you start thinking this way now. Uh, is there more energy in a salad than a Coca-Cola? Things like this is all energy for your mana, your mana, your prana that you need to live on, and you will need in, in times of emergencies or in times when you're trying to help others. And so um, this, this third path, which is really focusing on, on putting energy, your own energy in through your own crystal, through your own mind, through your own body, putting, replenishing your well that's in you, uh, is really in the end, uh, this will be the best path in the end. Uh, and that's when you are true to yourself, true to your essence. Um, all the, you know, the, the great teachers and gurus have all wanted to help us with this, the good ones. The bad ones have tried to steal this from us, and organizations uh, uh, and fundamental religions try to steal this manna from you and keep it from you, so you become uh, just, you know, uh, also slaves, so to speak, to their energy. And I've, I've met uh, I've met a whole number of gurus where you, people are addicted to their energy. Uh, fascinating. I've been with gurus that asked me to meditate with them, and by the end of the meditation, I had no energy left at all. I, I literally would have to go, go to the hotel and rest the rest of the day. So, uh, so it's very, it's, the best thing is to feed yourself, you know, put the energy into your chakras. Just don't think they're, they're, they're going to stay healthy and active forever because it's directly related to your biology also. Some spiritual people separate biology and the, and the, the real workings of these systems as if they're sort of magical or, or something that's just uh, another plane. Uh, but they're directly connected to and operate with your biology. And so the, the core essence is, is, the, is the really important lesson here, and, and the careful work with light. Um, if you're not adept at it, um, uh, it's like children playing with fire quite often. Um, 
And so um, it's like uh, some people I know that have, have uh, really uh, gotten into um, uh, Kundalini yoga. I've seen people get hurt with Kundalini yoga. I've seen people with like burns on their head. Uh, I have pictures of them. Uh, I've, I've seen people uh, just have that chakra blow out and end up uh, in a mental institution for several days so they cool down. So you've got to be careful with this stuff. And, um, and a good guru will be careful with you about this.